Hey, I want to share a message, and I'm going to do a little two-part mini-sermon series. Uh, first part today, second part next week. Uh, and I want to call this mini-series on Mother's Day. I'm going to call it baggage. But let me explain. Let me explain. If I stand out there in the foyer, I notice one thing loud and clear. Whenever mothers are coming into the foyer from the, the uh, parking lot, they usually have uh, like a toddler in one hand and a, an infant on one hip and a diaper bag on one shoulder and a purse on the other. And somewhere in there, they're juggling a caramel macchiato or something. And I don't know how they're doing it all. They got a lot of baggage going on. And shortly right behind them comes dad with a black coffee. <laughs> Not all dads, but most of them. Now we will give it to them. They did park the car, you know, bless their heart. They parked the car. Uh, don't worry, guys. I'll pump you up on in June on Father's Day. But uh, the fact is we have a lot of ladies have a lot of baggage and I don't know they they have this this ability to multitask and carry a lot of different pieces of the baggage. Uh, and I know you really can't separate from that. Your emotions are intertwined into everything. You don't necessarily uh, naturally compartmentalized like most dads and dudes. And I know that's not necessarily a good trait, but it's just what we do. We compartmentalize. Everything's connected. So because of that, when one person in the family feels pain, moms feel the pain. Dad isn't even sure if anybody got hurt or not. You know, it's just, it's just different like that. So you're connected. So you pick up on the, the hint of emotion and pain and trouble and, and depression and discouragement. You pick up all that, so you carry all of that baggage. And here's the point. Life is better when there's less baggage. Can I get an amen? See, too many people are carrying around a whole lot of baggage, and that baggage is keeping them from going where God wants them to go and becoming what God wants them to become. And here's what happens. We start in our life without any baggage, but then you get disappointed by somebody baggage. Then somebody lets you down, baggage. Then you missed over, passed over for a promotion, baggage. Then a relationship goes out, baggage. And, and it didn't happen all at once because you would notice it if it happened all at once. But just a little bit here and a little bit there, you pick up so much baggage that it starts weighing you down. And what do you do when you experience all those hurts and disappointments and the, the frustrations over the years? Then what happens is many people just get bitter about life. They get bitter and they don't even know why they're bitter. They just don't like life anymore because they have picked up so much baggage, it's weighing them down. And they've never really learned to let go of that baggage. They've never learned to just drop it or to forgive, because that's what I'm going to talk to you about, how to forgive. I'm going to let the scriptures just guide us through today and next week. Uh, but I think that learning to forgive is one of the biggest challenges that we face as Christians. Uh, in fact, there's an entire book called Philemon that deals with how to forgive, and how to reconcile relationships. And I'll talk about how to reconcile relationships next week on Graduation Sunday. But Philemon was written by the Apostle Paul to a man by the name of Philemon. He was, uh, Paul was in prison. He had been wrongfully accused, and he had appealed as a Roman citizen. He had appealed to Caesar, which was his right. So while he awaited his day in court, he's in prison, and he decides to write letters. So he writes letters to uh, the Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, we know those books of the Bible, and he writes to Philemon. To this man, it's just one chapter, 25 verses. We'll look at all of it, half of it today, half of it next week. But Philemon was a guy who hosted a church in his house, so he was, I mean, he was part of the church. He was a wealthy man, and he also had slaves, which I'll talk more about biblical slavery next week. But in ancient times, slavery was different than what we know it here during the U.S. and Civil War. Uh, in ancient times, it was, a more, it was temporary. It was more of a means to get out of debt than anything else. It was more like an employee-employer relationship uh, from what we read in the Bible. So this slavery was different. But Philemon had a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus stole from Philemon and then ran away. And he ends up 
being caught by the Roman authorities and placed in jail. He's put in jail, and guess who his cellmate is? Paul. He's in a prison cell next to Paul. So Paul does what Paul does and starts preaching the gospel to this guy named Onesimus and ends up leading him to the Lord. Onesimus accepts Christ as his Savior, and then he asks the secondary question, so Onesimus, what are you in here for? He says, well, I'm on the run from my master Philemon from Colossae, which is where Colossians, the book of Colossians came from. And he says, Philemon from Colossae, he said, I know that guy. He's a son in the Lord to me. He's one of my spiritual sons. Of course, now Onesimus is a spiritual son of the Apostle Paul. So Paul realizes that he's in the prison cell, first of all, to lead Onesimus to the Lord, but second of all, to help reconcile the relationship between him and Philemon. And I believe that there's no greater destroyer of relationships than unforgiveness. Marriages end because of unforgiveness. Family members stop talking for years because of unforgiveness. Friendships die because of unforgiveness. And here's what I know. No one should look back on your life and see a long list of broken relationships because you couldn't forgive, wouldn't forgive, or didn't know how to forgive. So Paul's going to teach us how to forgive and the best way to live. Philemon chapter one, verse number one, it'll be on the screen. You can follow on the Freedom Church app or on at Bible Gateway or in your Bible. Philemon chapter one says this, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, to Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Now, here's verse three. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul opens this letter with a Hebrew and a Greek greeting. The Greek greeting is the grace, and the Hebrew greeting is the peace or shalom. And so here's Here's what I believe that Paul would teach us out of just this one portion. Number one, you got to remember that you've been forgiven. He's, he's emphasizing grace and peace. You've experienced grace. You've experienced peace. I want you to understand that. Remember that, Philemon. You've experienced grace. You got to remember you've been forgiven. In fact, here's just a couple of weeks ago. I was with Mace. I don't know if he's back there. He was up here on the stage just a minute ago. Uh, there he is. There's Mace right there. We went to Cracker Barrel, and he'll tell you this is true. Uh, so my grandson and I, we went to Cracker Barrel and our waitress came up to us and her name was Shalom. It was right there on her apron and Shalom. I thought, Oh, I know what that means. It means peace. And I thought this is going to be an interesting conversation. So I asked her, I said, Hey, how did you get your name? I thought there's gotta be a great story. She said, my parents gave it to me. Uh, after my older brother was born, his name was Sam. And, uh, they decided they wanted some peace in their homes, so they named me Peace. Shalom. I said, well, did it work? She said, I don't know, because they named my little brother after me, Salem, which means perfect peace. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, <laughs> try. I'm, sure, I'm sure that Shalom was a great, great, beautiful, kind uh, woman. But you got to remember that you've been forgiven. If you really want to learn how to forgive, remember you've been forgiven. And Jesus kind of teaches this a little bit when he sits down with this religious leader and uh, they're having dinner. And then this former prostitute comes up to Jesus and starts washing his feet. And Simon, the religious leader, is kind of appalled by it. Thinking, I can't believe you're letting her touch you. That's the, his attitude. And Jesus uses this moment to teach a lesson on forgiveness. And in Luke 7, verse number 41, it says, A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins and their many have been forgiven 
So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Now, listen, I'll say this kind of as a little sidebar note. We are a very eclectic group of people here at Freedom Church. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different scenarios. We come from different. Our stories are different. And sometimes you may not understand why one person worships the way they do. You don't know their story. You don't know where they came from. You don't understand. Some people may not understand why somebody has their hands lifted up or another has tears running down their face or another wants to be on their knees. You don't understand where they've come from. But when you have been forgiven much, you want to offer that to the Lord in thanksgiving and praise. So if we're Christian, then we should understand that we are the woman here in this story who has been forgiven much. And because of that, as long as we never forget how much we've been forgiven, we can become people who forgive others. And that should be our goal. Look at verse number four. It says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Now, Paul's going on. He's writing to Philemon, remember? Now, notice here how much he points out about Philemon's good traits. He says, I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening and understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love, here's another thing he's pointing out. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. Because of you, brother, you have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. What was he doing? He was helping him remember all the good in his life. And this is the second thing that I think we learned that will help us learn how to forgive. Number two, remember the good in your life. Remember the things that God has done in your life. Remember the, the, the victories that he has brought you through. Remember the valleys that he's brought you out of. How he was reminding Philemon how God had changed his life, had done a work in his life. And here's what happens. When we remember where we came from, it's a whole lot easier to forgive others. When you forget where you've come from, sometimes you withhold that forgiveness. When we forget all of that good, we forget the grace and mercy that God has shown us, oftentimes we become self-righteous, angry, unforgiving people. And that's why a lot of the people in the world don't want to have anything to do with us. We need to be operating the same type of grace towards others that God operated towards us. Can somebody help me? Look, in fact, Jesus kind of drills down a little bit more with his teaching in Matthew 18. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Can you imagine trying to fit 10,000 bags of gold? And that'd be a wonderful problem to have. But 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now, some calculations say that 10,000 bags of gold today would be worth somewhere between four and five billion dollars. In other words, an impossible debt to repay. And that's what the point is that Jesus is making here. And then he goes on. He said, at, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. Now, I want you to notice something here. Don't miss this part. He says, be patient with me and I'll pay back everything. I want you to notice what his prayer, what his request, what his plea was, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment, and it's going to be very critical for you to get this if you want to operate in forgiveness and you want forgiveness in your life. He says, be patient with me. I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins... Are you kidding me? 100 silver coins compared to 10,000 bags of gold? There's no comparison. When he found his fellow servant who owed him 100 silver coins, he grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Well, his fellow servant fell to his knees, begged him, be patient with me. I'll pay it back. But he refused. And instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. They went to the master uh, and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, the, the first servant. So you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours. The $5 billion debt, I canceled it. You begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? 
In an anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sisters from the heart. What? In other words, if we don't operate in forgiveness, we're going to be thrown in jail. That's what he's saying. We're the ones that get put in prison. So here's the problem in the story that Jesus tells. The man who owes the money, the man that owes the 10,000 bags of gold, he never asked for mercy. He never asked for forgiveness. If you don't hear anything else, just hear this right here. You can go ahead, you can go back to sleep in a minute, okay? You can start working on you know, your draft picks later. Just hear this. Don't miss this. He never asked for mercy. He only asked for more time. Here's why that's important. Because every single one of us, we are this man who owes the 10,000 bags of gold. We owe an impossible debt. Back to God, we can't pay for our sins. We can't do enough to get good credit to be sin-free. We can't. We're sinners, and we need a Savior. We broke the law. We owe a debt. We can't pay it back. So why did this guy not show mercy to the fellow that his fellow servant who owed 100 silver coins? Why did he not show mercy to that guy? Because he did not see himself as forgiven. You know why? Because he didn't ask for forgiveness. He just asked for more time. And here's what happens. When you show mercy and compassion and you forgive others, it reveals something about you. It reveals that you've experienced forgiveness yourself. When you refuse to forgive, it reveals you have not experienced forgiveness. I know right now, hundreds of minds are just, wait a minute. You're telling me that if I don't forgive somebody, I haven't experienced forgiveness. I, I have experienced forgiveness. I want you to know. I've ex- I, I can see it. I can see it right now. Here's the issue. You got an issue with this? Go talk to God about it because I didn't make it up. I'm just the messenger today. He said, If we don't forgive others, then we can't be forgiven ourselves. Understanding that we are sinners in need of forgiveness allows us to show other people grace. And to those who have been forgiven much, you are always much more willing to forgive others quickly. It should cause us to say, God has forgiven me of so much worse. Therefore, I want to show mercy and grace to others. Here's the last part, and I'm going to stop with this. Musicians, come on back. Look at verse number eight. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Now, Paul was just talking about his role in the spiritual relationship with Philemon. You're my spiritual son. It's kind of like just a father-son relationship. I could force you to do this. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It says none other than Paul, an old man. He's just saying, look, I'm just an old man here. I'm a prisoner of Christ. But I'm appealing on the basis of love. Philemon, do the right thing. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. What's Paul doing here? Paul is trying to get Philemon to forgive Onesimus because Paul knows that here's the third point. I'm going to stop. Remember that forgiveness will set you free. He was trying to get Philemon to understand that his freedom is dependent upon his forgiveness. If he's willing to forgive, he'll walk in freedom. If he's not, he will be placed in prison himself, a spiritual prison, and be tortured for the rest of his life. Now, before I get too far from that last scripture, Paul was actually using a play on words. The name Onesimus actually means useful. So he says, Onesimus used to be useless to us, meaning he was a slave that robbed from you, stole from you, and ran away from you. But now he's useful to us. He's part of the body. He's now part of our family. We are brothers in the Lord. So I want you to forgive him. Forgiveness will set you free. See, here's the deal. Forgiveness is not a natural response whenever we're hurt and whenever we're wronged. You know what the natural response is? Revenge. Revenge is the natural response. And that's normal. But here's the problem with that. 
Revenge promises you something that it cannot deliver. Revenge promises you that if you will make somebody pay for what they did to you, or you will make them feel the way you felt, then that will start the healing process. We think that if we can just make somebody hurt the way we hurt, then somehow or another, that's going to make the earth balanced again, and my healing will start or my healing will continue. It's a lie. And here's why, because more people than we realize, we operate in this unforgiveness and we think that somehow or another, if we just make somebody pay for it, if we just show them anger, we show them uh, uh, frustration and we don't, don't let them back in our life and we just cut them out of everything that somehow or another making them feel miserable is going to make us feel good. But we can't understand why we're still miserable. And every time we see them, we're just ticked off again. Every time we hear their name, our blood starts boiling again. Why? Because you're putting yourself in prison. Jesus said, you're going to be the one in prison. If you don't forgive, you're going to be the one in prison. You know, the real reason why revenge is so ugly and revenge doesn't satisfy is because it's not our job. And we're trying to do something that God said clearly is my job. God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? That means payback is God's job. And so I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not God. And so when we start trying to do God's job, no wonder we're frustrated. No wonder we're miserable. No wonder it's not helping. No wonder we still got to go to drugs and alcohol and everything else to try to satisfy because this isn't working. Why? Because it's not our job. Our job is to forgive. Our job is to love. I know this isn't easy. I know it's, it's so much easier said than done. It's easy for me to get up here and just yell it out at you. But I struggle with it too. I struggle with it too. I've been hurt. I've been betrayed. I've betrayed and I've hurt. And I found that the only way be able to continue moving forward and stay out of the prison of unforgiveness is to walk in forgiveness every day of my life. Look quickly as I stop. Forgiveness, it takes three intentional decisions. You got to recognize it's about you. You got to quit blaming somebody. This is about you. This is about you making the decision for yourself. Number two, it's deciding to forgive right now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Now, here, today. You're on notice. You've been served. It's time to operate in forgiveness now. And number three, it takes being forgiven to be able to forgive. See, there's a reason why this message on forgiveness touches all of us and stirs a little bit in all of us because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We've all blown it. We all need forgiveness. And we've all been stabbed in the back a few times and have to deal with this thing called forgiving somebody else. You want to be free? You got to learn to forgive. You want to walk in freedom and stay in freedom? Gotta stay out of the prison of unforgiveness. It will rob you 